and welcome to the press conference for BlackBerry and Screens this evening in the competition of the 73rd Berlinale. Let me introduce these people you already know because you saw the film. Starting on the far right, Carrie Ellis. Hey guys, I just moved from Canada. Um, the difference between Waterloo and Silicon Valley is kind of the difference between shooting a film in Toronto Hamilton and shooting in London. Knowing Jay and Matt, if you could talk about the unique opportunities and the challenges of making Canadian films and telling a Canadian story on the world stage without succumbing to the obviousness that would have taken a film like this and put it through a, an American machine. You first, buddy. Oh, yeah, sure. It's funny, it's kind of like you can't really tell, I said this earlier, but it's tough as a Canadian, I think, to see beyond the water you swim in. So I'm not sure necessarily um, what we did to try to avoid the pratfalls that a lot of Canadian films fall into that give you that bizarre, uncanny valley that I'm sure many of you as critics often see with Canadian content where you're watching and like, I don't know what this is, but something is wrong. Right? And I'm, in my opinion, often that's a kind of ersatz Americanism that Canadian filmmakers try to emulate, which is so pathetic, obviously. And it, it, to get away from that, I think you need to just figure out a style that's uniquely your own and just stick to it and not cave to the pressure of doing things the way that um, maybe more experienced uh, regulators would want you to, because there's a massive pressure, if you can't tell, I'm not sure what things are like in Germany, but there's a massive pressure for us to emulate American filmmaking style. Massive. And it, it's so nefarious that it bleeds into the culture so that even film students, for the most part, are really just trying to recreate American films the way that they're made, and unfortunately that's never going to happen in our country. In the same way that here in Germany you're not going to be making American films, because there's an American culture around filmmaking that to you imitate it in peril. And so for Jay and I, what we tried to do was keep everything as local as we could. We worked with an entirely Canadian 
crew, all the people in key roles in the film were my close friends who I'd grown up with. And we wanted to maintain a aesthetic that we developed in Toronto and not break too far from that. In terms of the financial logistics of that, really it just meant working with Canadian financiers and not working with Americans. And I think that got us halfway there. I'm sure your perspective is different though as an actor. Yeah, so for me it was like, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a very simple thing. And, and uh, forgive me if I sound like a bit of an asshole when I sort of say something that's underwhelming is what I'm about to say, but, but it's like, you kind of just got to do your thing and not worry about everybody else, which is, I think, how most movies are made elsewhere. When I say not worry about everybody else, I mean not worry about getting into Blockbuster or whatever modern equivalent of trying to break into the States is, you know. Um, I, I, I've, I've often talked kind of publicly about how frustrating it is to watch a movie that you know is Canadian, is everyone, you can hear it in the accents and you can see the bloody sea and tower in the background when someone opens their wallet and there's American money in there out of a sort of servile kind of pre-censorship, right? And so I think that like, I was a fan of his because I loved the stories he told and I love that he wanted to tell them where he told them. And I, that is exactly how I feel. And you and I have talked about that sort of thing before. And so it was, it's as simple, it really is as simple as saying a movie takes place in Waterloo, Ontario, not saying Waterloo, Canada because out of fear that somebody might be like, what's Ontario, and as if that's gonna make them turn the fucking movie off, right? Like, that just doesn't happen, right? So it's just about, like, wh what he's talking about is, is it is part of a larger kind of uh, fight in English Canada against hegemony of the country to ourself. And it's just this thing, this is our sort of burden, and, and the only way that we can sort of get past that, if it's a thing to get past, is to just sort of like, assume we're anywhere else, and make the movie that we want to make. Simple as that. Okay, first uh, I wanted to say that I really enjoyed the movie. I laughed a lot. Thank and you. It was very funny. Thank you. One of my favorites so far. Um, well, this question is for Glenn. Uh, there's a scene towards the end of the movie where Jay's character and Glenn's character, well, Jay's character says, breaks some news to Glenn's character. And he uh, like, uh, acts in a way that we're not, we're not used to in the rest of the movie, like he doesn't get out of here at all. And I would say like maybe he's kind of proud even, I don't know, how, how would you say? We talked about that, <laughs> we talked about that moment a lot, uh, Matt and I. <clears throat> um, and what you sensed in that moment was, it was quite deliberate, it was, you know, I mean, Matt had this wonderful idea of putting all these masks in, in my office, my, my original office, and, and then even in my office at, uh, at RIM. And it's a moment where you see Jim's mask come off. But what, what was really important to me in that moment was to start that moment very much trying to maintain the persona that I had cultivated for many, many years. And then to realize in that moment that there was no point in doing that anymore, uh, that Mike had in some ways done exactly what I would have done. And I respect it, and I'm happy to pass the burden of having to be this person on to him and move on with the rest of my life. And that's what that moment was for me. Hi, um, Helen Barlow from the Australian newspaper. Um, I had a fucking Blackberry just <laughs> at the time when Apple, when iPhones were coming in and I'd come to festivals like Berlin and I couldn't use it. It, it was just becoming obsolete so rapidly. I, I just wonder if any of you guys had a, an experience like that and I'm, I'm so pleased that you're so true to your headband, Matt. Um, that was funny. <laughs> I really didn't want to wear this headband, but I was encouraged. Your question seems to be whether each of us had blackberries. And I'll go first and, and admit, not only that I never had one, I never touched one before we started shooting this movie. The first time I ever held a blackberry in my hand was on set. Um, I had no uh, cultural relationship with them whatsoever, apart from knowing them, knowing that my dad used one. So, but, so I, I think I was an outlier. <coughs> For me, blackberry was one of the few countries that I had like a true sense of brand loyalty towards. Like, I only got rid of mine about three years ago when my 
your mother teamed up with my wife and my sister and said, you're not on group text, so you can't see your baby niece. So I said, what do you, what do, you do with that, right? So, like, yeah, but I like the buttons. I said, all right, so it doesn't do anything. So, so now I'm just like every other person. But, uh, but yeah, I adored it. I adored the tech. I thought it was a great machine. And I can't believe I adored the tech. <laughs> God forbid I ever say that sentence again. But, uh, but yeah, it was a wonderful machine. And I was also like, I get real hokey here. Um, I was proud that it was a Canadian thing, you know, and I tried to, wherever possible, kind of support, you know, my stuff made in my country. So, uh, yeah, I loved it, um, and it was a huge bummer when everyone stopped using them. I do not support Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, I never had one. Oh, no. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I love Canada. <laughs> I really do, actually. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, but no, I never had a BlackBerry uh, for the exact reasons that uh, everyone loved and wanted a BlackBerry. Uh, those were all those, all the major selling points of what was great about having a BlackBerry were all the reasons that I didn't want one, which is to be available at any time to communicate with. Um, I just want to be left alone most of the time and to have this damn thing pinging and beeping at me all the time. So I didn't do it until I saw the iPhone. I was completely seduced by it, just like everyone else was. I was like, well, that's just so cool. <laughs> There's nothing cool to me about the BlackBerry. It's just like, yeah, it's just a, it's just a mini computer. I didn't even like my computer. If I could have thrown my computer out from the dog, you know what I mean? I want like a, just a small, then the iPhone. Oh, <laughs> so cool. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I didn't I, I, I actually... <clears throat> was a, a fan of Palm. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I'm old but then I helped build 3M because I spent a lot of money on that, on that device. Um, I never had a Blackberry, um, and I didn't even know it was a Canadian company, actually, until I read the script. And so, uh, but I thought it was appropriate that, uh, that uh, Matt Casting is called Yankowski being a Palm pilot fan. Okay. It was very difficult. We were looking for actors who specifically only use Palm Pilots. It's not me. We found Pond. Carrie. Yeah. yeah. And Kelsey Brown. <laughs> 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 that was it. It was too <laughs> Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Barclays. I work for One Press TV in Sweden. First, I want to say that Dr. Gosega, I mean, I was surprised how good he was. He was really good and great acting. Thank you. It was the first movie I saw in Berlin this year, and I was, it was really good. Well, thank you. And Glenn, you were playing Jim as a kind of like tough character, you know, like if it's the Wall Street guy. But still, it was a serious role. You still made it really funny, the character. So tell us short about that, and Matt Johnson, you're the writer, director, and you're one of the leading acting role. Just tell us shortly about your experience. Uh, my approach to comedy, frankly, is the same as my approach to, or sorry, I should say my approach to dra dramatic work is the same as my approach to comedy. Uh, I will always approach it from the standpoint of fighting as hard as possible for the character to get what he wants. Uh, whatever that is, and constantly checking in with the people that he's trying to get what he wants from to see if he's getting it, right? It's the basic acting shit, right? But, um, so for me, um, there's almost no difference between a comedic performance and a dramatic performance. If there's any difference at all, it's what the person, what the character is fighting for. Often in a comedy, what the person is fighting for is insane or ridiculous, and that's what makes it funny to me. I don't like comedic performances that are anything less than dramatic performances about a character who's fighting for something ridiculous. So uh, my approach wasn't really that different from my approach to comedy. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 rec I recognize that there were aspects of it that were funny, but uh, it was certainly never, never played for, for laughs. Not that that's what you were suggesting. You're supposed to be acting in this? Yeah, originally, I, I, I had no plans to act in this. 
mostly because all of our partners were vehemently against it. <laughs> Actually, they're sitting right in front of you. Wow, that's crazy. I remember me saying, I don't see you in this room. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I, you know, Johnson, I just, I love you, I don't see you as well. Um, and it was Jay who on the phone, when I, we were talking about the, the film, said, I'm only going to do this if you'll act with me. And I thought, fuck, this is going to be really hard, because not only am I going to need to live up to his impression of what that's going to mean, but it means that what he's actually saying to me is, I want you to be there to support me as an actor, and we wound up doing that the whole film, and that was really a treat of my life. Because it wasn't really like directing the film, it was really like having that relationship that you see in the movie expand outside of the, of the context of the film. Because that very much became our relationship in real life mm -hmm. as we were making the film. As he had some very deliberate things that he was trying to do, and I was always trying to maintain a sense of fraternity and camaraderie on set. And sometimes those really came into conflict with one another. But it made our job a lot easier because it meant that we could relate as friends both in the film and in our actor-director relationship, which was very important to Jay, to his credit. Like, so much so that almost, and actually I would say Glenn as well, it was like the three of us almost had a little cabal where we would just speak about what we were doing, and that conversation never really, from the three of us, broke out into larger group discussions. So uh, it helped me hugely, it helped me hugely, but I saw it as a directing tool more than as a, a means to an end as an actor. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> How much did you regret that decision, Jay? Oh, you yeah, know, we'll see. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just beginning the promo cycle. So, so, who knows? So, no, I just, it, it's simple. I, I liked his movies, and he's in all his movies. So I was like, if we're going, if I'm going to be an MJ movie, I want him to be there. From AFP News Agency. Man, I was curious about what you, you were speaking about earlier about that sort of um, particular Canadian sensibility, maybe way of storytelling, aesthetic. You know, if you could kind of articulate, you know, how you would define that. And then for you and possibly also um, Glenn, um, I mean, apart from the clothing and the glasses and, and uh, the technology, I felt like this kind of particular type of toxicity in the workplace was right. very much like of its time. And I was wondering if you could, could talk about that as well. Sure. Um, in terms of trying to define the Canadian culture via film, that's an ongoing conversation. I think the biggest flaw that we have culturally is that we haven't defined a cultural language in terms of our cinema. In English Canada, right? The French Canadians are very good. They're doing extremely well, as I'm sure you know. But many of the major American directors right now are French Canadians. Um, in English cinema, we are really wrestling with what it is we're supposed to do, mostly because of this kind of imitation game that's happening in the United States. I think that a lot of film students, as I said before, are being put under tremendous pressure to, to ape all of these other styles, and our funding system is not at all set up to develop young voices at all. Whereas in Quebec, it almost seems like a priority. Um, and in America, the commercial system supporting filmmakers winds up creating an ersatz um, uh, uh, talent pool for young people because there winds up being money for young voices simply because the market's so huge. We don't have that in Canada. In Canada, there's virtually no market. And so it really is up to, uh, well, I mean, I'm on this course a lot, but it really is up to uh, our government to try to find ways to support young people to take risks. And right now, we're not doing that. So and it's, it's hard for me to, to to say what the Canadian style is because it hasn't been developed yet. It's a work in progress though. But how much do you think streaming is going to change that? You talking about like the new laws happening within Canada? Not yeah. just that, just the fact that you know there's a movement away from theatrical towards streaming, and and the streaming market is keeping uh, everybody's house. I mean, it's there. It's a bigger market if you think about it. Yes, it's a bit of an equalizer. Yeah. I, I think. I think that in terms, at least in terms of the market yeah. question. So I think what Matt was trying to touch on is that Canadians don't typically go to see English Canadians don't typically go to see English Canadians in them. By and large, right? Um, I, I want to rewind a second to say that, that we, we have gone through sort of uh, waves, right? And so there was a period where, uh, you know, what used to be called the, the, the new wave of Canadians and all the, the 90s guys like Egoyan and McCallor and, uh, and Cronin. And that was all inherited kind of Cronenberg style. It was a 
12 versions of a sort of potentially uh, cold or but but about but about sort of really kind of harsh <laughs> sexual dysfunction that was yeah. the thing that we made movies about um, and then we made movies that trying to look like American things right right we really we really departed from that with Golden Age of about six people making movies in Toronto yeah like Lynn Stockovich and all these fucking crazy ass movies yeah. Yeah. like now but but what you're saying about streaming is at this point now people kind of click on the thing they want that looks interesting to them, right? And so it doesn't have any kind of, uh, my friend Jacob Tierney years ago said, English Canada has to get to a point where it stops watching its shit as, uh, as homework or as like the right thing to do just because you want to watch a movie, right? And we're kind of there in TV and we've been there in TV for a while, like Canadians do watch Canadian television. In, in movies, I think in streaming, they don't know the stories. They just see a movie that they either want to watch or they don't. So t that makes me hopeful. Sorry, Glenn, you had a, they, they also asked you a question. <laughs> 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 you know it's called the corporate toxic culture of yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ask me about that. Let's attack all of it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, boy, heavy question. What, ask the question one more time, just so I'm very clear on what it is that you're asking, sorry. I mean, I felt like it's a, it's a period piece, you know, and what jumped out at me is also this kind of toxic, you know, extremely male um, workplace. It seems very much of its time, and I was wondering, uh, yeah, sort of, uh, if you could comment on, on that aspect of the film. I mean, I, it did, wouldn't have changed my uh, approach to the character. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I guess I could wonder if if I if Jim would have approached things differently had it not been such a male dominated workforce. That I think that I think you think it would have changed. I, 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 the, the well, way look, I'll say from my point of view, it was yeah. a conscious choice to keep you in rooms with a bunch of young men. Uh, because uh, that, to me, represented a world that I knew very well from my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be uh, it almost seem anachronistic, but there is a culture of. Uh, like men's locker rooms, of men's sports, of men's competition that I grew up in in the 90s that was, that it had a feeling that, that I just knew. I knew what it felt like when I was with all my friends, say, we played Warhammer, and somebody of a higher status from a sports team or something would come in the room. Mm -hmm. I knew that feeling so well. Like, I just knew it. I could taste it. Uh, that's, and, and, and interestingly enough, my my experience in life is almost completely different. I've never enjoyed uh, male-dominated spaces. I don't. I, I prefer feminine energy personally to, to male energy. I, yeah. But what a nice guy! No, I'm. Just, <laughs> it's not. It's not. Uh, it, it's more just that I'm really. Uh, I think this is. It was an interesting thing to explore as an actor uh, to this this, this alpha male persona because it's something that I reject in my real life. I don't, I tend not to like, I don't like alpha male energy. I, if I sense an alpha male trying to do alpha male things in a room with me, I'm just like, it just comes off as very insecure to me. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't come off the way I think the person hopes it's coming off, which is confident, it just comes off as insecure. Uh, so. It, it was a lot of fun to do as an actor. It's great to be able to explore a side of myself that I don't explore in my real life. Um, and in some ways, it's a little bit easier for me to do that, to put on that mask as opposed to just to be, you know, something that's closer to myself. Um, it's also just uh, that type of person, the type of person that Jim is, has always been extremely fascinating to me. Um, so it was a lot of fun to play, but um, you're right. I mean, the, 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 there, there is definitely a, a feeling of, of toxic male energy throughout the, the film. <laughs> I mean, the tension, yeah. I think, at, at a certain level is that at any moment, a fight could break out. And that was something that I know Jay and I were very conscious of in introducing a guy like Glenn, specifically his characterization. Because these are guys who are never going to fight. Like, Mike and I were not going to get into a fight over anything, but the idea that this guy's here and there was a threat of violence all of a sudden, even though it's never materialized, was was important, right? It's very important for a bunch of guys who basically 
spend their lives avoiding conflict and avoiding fighting, right. to be introduced to a presence where it's like, no, at any minute, it, it, this, he'll beat us up. It's like it very much felt like we're kids again, and this guy could beat us up if he wanted to. And this, I, I assume that this wasn't in the book, to do a definition in the script. You know, it's funny, it's a to. Yeah, I, you, you know, it's in the gaps of the pages. This type, this type of energy. You, know? <laughs> you, 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 you can find, you can find this in, in, in the book, but you just need to, yeah, look at the margin. But they didn't participate all the way through the film. No, 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 no. I, I'm very interested to see what they think. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to say it. Uh, our last film, right, was called Kazakhstan. Um, cinematography in this movie was really astonishing. That's what I liked a lot. And I wanted to ask about the decision-making process. Why you chose to have like this chaotic, out-of-focus camera, and how did you make it like in terms of technical aspects? How do you like that, Jared? Rao, our cinematographer. Why did we choose to have this out-of-focus camera? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah, well, no, in all honesty, the, the goal here, I, I come from a background of fake documentary filmmaking. That's all the films I've made have been fake documentaries. So I really, I love that aesthetic. I love the aesthetic of an IQ being behind a camera because it makes everything so much more interesting to me because then I get to watch the movie at two levels. I get to watch what I'm being shown and I get to watch the intelligence of the observer. It's something I've always, I love. I, I, I find it extremely addictive. And I also find you can play games when you use that as a tool because you can direct the audience's attention to odd things using zoom lenses. And, and to make this film, Jared and I wanted to graduate up to a much more cinematic space and that meant we needed to use huge cameras with lenses that were like three and a half feet long. I think that our biggest was like a 50 to a 500 millimeter lens. So then we're talking about like um, National Geographic animal photography lenses, right? so that we could stay extremely far away from the actors, and I mean extremely far, so far away that, let's say that we were shooting this scene right now, the cameras would be so far away we wouldn't be able to see them. Um, and also, so we shoot two cameras at the same time so that we can cut whenever we want and use moments that the actors are using that are only gonna happen once. And it's one of the reasons I cast comedians. It's because I knew that their performances were going to be uh, not just kinetic, but um, random. And this shooting style let me record random performances knowing that even if an actor wasn't able to ever do it again, it didn't matter because I would have captured it in both twice and in a way that I knew I'd be able to use it because the audience would be used to a language of not getting everything perfectly. Um, so really, I'm happy you liked it aesthetically, but it is almost a practical function why we shoot this way, because it makes our job as storytellers easier, because we get to use it as a tool as opposed to just an aesthetic choice. And so I'm sure you're just a documentary fan, which is why the shooting style works. Um, Andreas Hai from guestbuildblog.com. Uh, um, your characters are based on real persons, so how did you get the information to interpret your characters? As I understood, you didn't contact the persons, or did you contact people from that era, we did, we spoke with people from the era, we spoke with none of the people though. I mean, this is based off a book that did the majority of the research for us, and so the entire script comes from that book, minus a few things that we took from other sources. Um, but I was very lucky to speak with a number of Research in Motion employees, a lot of ex-employees, mostly from this, this 90s era, era. One in particular came through in a huge way, who kept a diary and a journal, and gave me everything that he had kind of captured while he was working there. And he was, in some ways, what I was drawing from for not just myself, but all of the characters who started to feel a bit despondent about what happened in the workplace, because he himself left in the mid-2000s during the culture change. So he was he was happy to, to share that information. But none of the rest of us met the people we were playing. Um, I think it, it ought to be the person who did the most research on who he was playing was probably Carrie. Is that, do you think that's true, Carrie? I can attest to that. These guys showed up with great preparation, all of them. Um, I was very lucky. I got to play a character who was very much larger than life. And uh, it was like playing characters that are larger than life. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Well, I think it's actually true. You're being humble. Like, he knows more or less the entire 
biographical information of Karl Yankowski. I was just talking about it in the last interview. I, I was learning things that I didn't even know about him, and I wrote the character, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, having known that, that Matt had done so much research on the story, I, I, and, and, and knowing that uh, our, our characters weren't, they, they didn't have uh, large public personas, so it wasn't really important so much to me to emulate the real man as it was to inhabit the man in the script. Um, so I, I, I really focused almost entirely, I mean, I'd certainly researched it, but, I, but the majority of my focus really was was on and had, on being the person that I, I saw in the script and through conversations with Matt and what his vision of the, of the film and the character were. Um, my name is Mahar Sadiq, I'm from Germany for Jim News. This film has a script that can be easy because we know the story, Canada, Bradbury, Obama had also a Bradbury film on that and like that. But you think of the characters and uh, I was amazed because you remember me, John Belushi. Aha, uh -huh. what a compliment. No, really. That because of that. That, that <laughs> was very, no, no, really. Uh, uh, and so, how did you manage? That because, way. Uh, yeah, the script can be figured out, sure. Because uh, I don't know if you saw the whole film, <laughs> but I saw it yesterday night, and I went and, you know, like, and looked at Belushi, and I said, my God, this guy is the same. So, how can you, can you tell me how you managed to do that? Really interesting question. You are John Belushi, how did you do it? I, I don't know. Again, I, I have no idea. Um, it's, it, for the people who know me, who watch this film, they say I'm just being myself. So, and I, I'm, re I'm really just playing myself and trying to be as real as I can be. I also don't like John Belushi. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark is Mike Lazarus' favorite movie. 
That was one of the best things we got from the book because it created our legal case for showing Steven Spielberg to movie in the film without a license, which would have been impossible. So thank, so thank God. Hi, uh, Ariane Talk here from the University of College London Film and TV Society. I want to ask uh, Matt about the process of writing the film, in particular when you're adapting from a book about the history of Blackberry, what events you decided to extrapolate, or what, whether there were instances in which uh, you had to basically create a scenario based on you know, very little information. What was the process of adapting from the book like? Well, when we first read the book, my, my producing partner and co-writer, Matt Miller, and I thought, one, we were much more interested in the rise of the company than the fall. Much more interested. And because of that, it actually limited our scope to what years we were looking at. And once we kind of peeled off, like, oh, we want to talk about the 90s and the early 2000s, it actually made the writing a lot simpler because there were much fewer events, and you talked about how did we extrapolate the things that we didn't know. A lot of that stuff came from, one, talking with the people who were there, so people who didn't make it into the book, um, and then two, trying to inject things that I remember from that time in my own life into the film. So the, the movie, although it is about Blackberry, is, is quite personal in a lot of ways. Like These were conflicts that I was sort of having in my own life. And so it became obvious how a lot of things were and really, once these three characters kind of got spun up and went blinding, the movie did very, very much right itself. Like once you sort of have Jay doing what he's doing, Glenn doing what he's doing, and Doug doing what he's doing, they, the characters bounced off one another in a way where it became obvious what the next thing was going to be. So it was like, it was kind of like remembering a dream where you don't actually write it, you're just like, oh yeah, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It, it, was, it was not effortful, I'll say that. Maybe it's time for one more question. Anyone has one? Over there, you have not seen it. Thank you. Uh, Wazir Pismo from Derek Valley from Bulgaria. I have a question uh, for Miss, uh, Mr. Carlton and uh, Mr. Uh, Baruchel. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Uh, in the penultimate uh, scene from the movie, um, Mike Zilikis uh, and his CEO uh, talk, uh, and when he's uh, when Mike is uh, betraying Jim, sort of, and uh, he's going to the uh, um, to the SEC. Yes, SEC. Um, I want to ask you about the, the short uh, the short answer that uh, Mr. Carlton um, pronounces. It was something like, uh, "Okay, next door." and he uh, smiles. And for me, that was very uh, important in the film. Uh, and I want to ask the director and the cast what they think about that uh, uh, intense scene. Yes. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I think that it's the kind of, <clears throat> they, they both landed on the other side of the rainbow, kind of and he, they have absorbed each other in a way, and you know, there is now, where they were completely different machines, they now have a bunch of each other within them, right? You kind of see Mike become a version of Jim, or at least a version of Mike that Jim has kind of interfered with, or, you know, like, Jim is in the, that Mike, and I would argue that some of that Mike is now in Jim at that point, and when we get to that sort of ending, um, where basically, Mike, for lack of a better term, betrays Jim. Um, I think pun breaks his heart a little, but he's conflicted because he also respects it and knows that this could have gone no other way because this is how I groomed him to behave. He's making the decision I would have made. And so you have this, and, and what's amazing is in a movie, which has, you know, it's got some yelling in it and shit, this is a scene which is like, potentially the kind of quietest softest scene in the whole movie, and it's the one about the kind of saddest stuff. And so it was like, I don't know, I just knew when we were doing it that it was kind of the right sort of way to land the thing, and I know that, like, I, I, for me personally, the way that I was trying to play it was, yeah, be, be a version of him, but also hate myself for it. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that, no, that, that came across beautifully. And it was fun to play against as well. I mean, this is the scene that, 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 that I was referring to, that you were referring to earlier, I believe, as well. Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, for me, in that moment, yeah, it's both a, a mix of uh, being uh, cornered, um, realizing that there's no way out of that corner, realizing that the person who put me, who put me in that corner is the person that I turned into, the person who put me in the corner, being both proud of him for doing it and also relieved that I don't have to do it anymore. Relieved, you know, it's a person who's like, finally somebody caught me, <laughs> now I can stop, you know? Uh, so, I mean, that, that's what, that's, that's certainly what that scene is for me. And it, it's a beautifully shot scene too. I love the lighting in that scene, uh, you know, I, I, I'm standing, he's, he's in a more powerful position, sitting behind my desk. He's literally in my office, he's sitting behind my desk, and I'm standing there. And yeah, this, this, this beautiful role reversal that happens in that moment, and then one of the few moments in the film where my shoulders go down, you know, and I get a chance to just kind of soften a little bit. So it was, it was fun to get to play that moment, because it doesn't, you don't see that from my character throughout the film until that moment. Doug Conan and them talking about their acting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll tell you what I said with uh, Jared early on. So we did um, after day one of shooting, we had a little meeting on strategy. Okay. Yeah. My son was talking to Jared. We had a meeting on strategy. Okay. And you want to know what the meeting was? Okay. We're not going to talk about the shots anymore. Just put these guys in close up every take. And that's all we did. And that final scene is a great example of them working very well because. You may not know this, but most films, and, and these guys would know because they've done it their whole lives. Most films proceed like this. You shoot your master, then you shoot mediums, then you shoot close-ups, or sometimes the reverse. Sometimes the director will shoot the close-ups first. But these guys were so good, and again, they were doing such varied things that we needed a system where we'd be like, okay, we need to be on the close-up all the time. We can't shoot masters ever because we're going to miss all this stuff. And so that final scene is a great example, in my opinion, of this strategy really paying off. Because if we, I'm telling you, if we had shot a master of that scene and then gone in to shoot the close-ups after or vice versa, we would have missed half of yeah, that would have been a huge mistake. It would have been horrible. Because what Glenn, what you guys are all talking about, this moment where, where Jay feels incredibly, um, uh, uh, well, he said he hated himself. He plays that a couple times in the film, where you just see his eyes darting between the sides and saying, this guy knows he made a mistake. He knows he was a bad boy. That doesn't happen every time. Like, you guys just get to see the finished movie. It's really, really hard to find those little moments because they're magic, and they only happen once in a while. And so your camera needs to be ready, literally, to be like, oh shit, this is it. And then once you have it, you have it. But if that happens in the master, you're dead. Because it's not gonna happen again. And so, so this scene, was us trying to be ready for, for these magical moments of performance so that we knew we'd be able to use them. And I think it also takes a lot of pressure off the actors because it means that you don't need to be like, okay, now I'm in the close-up, now I need to do this. Okay, now I'm like, I get everything. Yeah, no, no, no shot, baby. <laughs> Big, small, large, I'm gonna shit. Yeah. That's what I hit it all. <laughs> Did we manage to get through a press conference without uh, anybody asking about Glenn's hair, so it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs>